Hello, and welcome to the photo scene. We are here, Vanya and myself. We're going to go over uh, the biggest mistakes photographers make when starting a photography business. So, uh, Vanya, do you want to go ahead and jump right into the first one? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, so, number one is pricing yourself the same as your competitors when you're starting out. Um, I think this can be really great for research purposes, obviously. Like, you do need to research your competitors, but uh, please don't copy their prices. Josie, have you done this? Like I did that when I was starting out and I learned very quickly that's that's a big no-no. So tell me, like, did you have experience in that? Did, is this a problem that you see with other photographers? I, I ha- I'm like 50-50 on that one, to be honest, because I okay. feel like I don't copy prices. I never have copy prices. I guess maybe I have. Oh, good girl. But the way that I would handle like figuring out my pricing is by looking at my competitors locally and seeing like what they were all charging. So I knew what my competition was doing. Right. And then obviously I would pick my own prices based on that. I'm not going to pick prices based on what everybody else is doing, but I just wanted to see what was going on out there. And it's been years since I've done that just because I'm at a really comfortable place right now. But I think it's definitely like uh, a really hot topic for people. I feel like a yeah. lot of people definitely aren't sure what they should price their photography at. And yeah, what do you think about that? Um, so I guess my thoughts are is like, I understand like for market research, but yeah. also like I think the best way you can possibly, because so here's the thing. So when you're looking at people's pricing and you're going over market research and you're looking at how they're pricing themselves, Some photographers are going to be super low. Why are they that low price? You don't know their situation. You don't know if this is a side gig for them. You don't know if they have other financial support. You don't know, uh, you know, what their situation is. Like maybe they're just a hobbyist and they're just trying to make some extra cash. Like, or maybe they're just starting out. Like, or they're brand new. Yeah, how to price themselves. So being up against that kind of person, or you know, on the opposite end of the spectrum. There is the higher pricing and you could be like, oh, I'm going to price myself, you know, closer to this pricing, but you don't know their experience. You don't know the kind of value they offer their clients, right? It's like you don't, to justify those, that kind of pricing, there, there must be a lot more going on than what you can possibly see. So I think that it's a very uh, iffy subject, but I know, you know, it's like i When I did it, I freaking came out the gate, like group on prices, like so stupid. Yeah. (laughs) I was just looking at, you know, around the neighborhood, like, well, whatever, like they're pricing themselves this way. Like, I guess I'll do that too. So that was a big mistake that I made, but I learned very quickly that I was going to burn out doing that. I wasn't going to be able to be financially secure. Um, So then I learned very quickly that what you need to do is actually price yourself of what you need to make a month. Like what yeah. is your bottom line of like add up all your bills, add up your expenses, add up uh, the lifestyle that you'd like to have one day, you know, like or create like vacations, anything extra. Like, I mean, those are the kind of things that you need to really take into consideration. I think that's more realistic to price yourself like that than to go off of somebody else's prices. Yeah. Um, those are my thoughts on it. <laughs> Yeah. And then, you know, if you go and price yourself too high, you're not going to book anything and it's going to like make you feel confused and depressed. And, you know, or if you're, if you're priced too low, then you confuse people and they're like, why, why are they too low? Then they maybe aren't worth the money. So it's like, there's definitely a happy medium for you. Like, you just got to find that like dance. Well, (laughs) Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, also, I mean, there is an element of like when you are just starting out, like you, you have to price yourself accordingly, right? Like you can't come out charging so much when you don't have the experience under your belt. I'm I'm a strong believer in getting the experience first. Um, and then, you know, getting your confidence built enough to be able to price yourself. If you go out there and price yourself and you're just like, you don't have all your business stuff in, you know, in workflow mode, you don't have a client experience, you don't have the value to offer, it's going to be very difficult to book people without all of that stuff. So 
Yeah. And then people need to think about the fact that, you know, if they're just starting and they're seeing that, that people are making more money, they're also probably, probably paying taxes and a lot of bills that they don't already have to pay. Yeah. So that's yeah. another thing to factor in too. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many elements that go into pricing. It's just pricing. Yeah. Like, very personal, very personal. It right? is. What do you call that system where you can figure out your pricing? I forgot the name of it. Was it a CODB? Oh, cost, cost of, of doing, doing business? business. Yeah. So you go to CO- Pro- Professional Photographers of America has a great cost of doing business calculator. We'll link it in the show notes. Um, but the PPA is great for all kinds of information business wise. Yeah. So not your business. I got a lot of my information off of that site. You can get your insurance I there. I have so, my gear insurance there. I recommend yeah. them all the time because they do they do good, good gear insurance versus yeah. like kind I mean, of they've crappy. been around for so long. So yeah. it's it's a it's a good one. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So any other thoughts you want to say on pricing yourself when you're um, I definitely think that uh, you have to like sit down with yourself and spend hours and it's not going to take just one day, one second. Like you literally mm-hmm. just need to write it all down, write down mm-hmm. what you want to make and all that stuff. And yeah. you're just going to, it's going to take some time, I feel like. And I do yeah. this quarterly or mm-hmm. every half a year, like I'm about to come up on it in July to where I'm going to raise my rates. And what I do is because I found my sweet spot with everything, I just raise everything 10%. Yeah. Or what I'm feeling. Like I could just do it once a year and do 20%, you know? Yeah. So it's just based on how I'm feeling. Yeah, absolutely. There's no right or wrong way. No. Well, and I think the longer you're in business too, it's just like you kind of figure out yes. what, what you are, what you feel like shooting, like what you're worth, right? Right. <laughs> like think about what you're worth, what you're going to go out and shoot for. You know, you have to have a bare minimum of what you will go out and shoot for. You have to calculate all the... Um, time it takes you. I mean, people don't calculate a lot of the travel, the time no. it takes you, the planning. If you're doing a lot of planning before the shoot with the client and working with them one on one, like I do, yeah. um, and then the after, the post production, like all the editing that you have to do, especially you, Josie, with other oh, weddings and couples, like you yeah. are always editing. Like you're an editing machine. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Jessie will be teaching a course just on how she edits so quickly because this lady. I do, crazy. and my clients don't know that, like because oh I do so much office work. Like most, like yeah. my nine to eight to six p.m. I don't know. I'm mostly doing office work. I'm sure you do too. It's like very yeah. little editing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's uh definitely important to incorporate those kind of elements. And if it takes you a long yeah. time to edit, like it does me, <laughs> yeah. um, which I basically like will like outsource a lot of that now. So I have to take that in consideration. Oh so man, if, that sucks. You know, I can't you do to, that part. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's yeah, hard. I like that control. I don't know. I know. Sometimes, sometimes it helps. Sometimes it hinders, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Kind of just have to do what works for you, but always take those yeah, costs definitely. of what you are, you know, your time. Take your time into consideration when pricing for sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So next topic is shooting what you think you should instead of what you want. How do you feel about that, Josie? Do you have any thoughts on that? I have a lot of thoughts on that, but yeah. that's because I've been doing this for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um so uh, there's always a dance with your business and being a business owner. It's like, it's tough all the time. But uh, mm-hmm. so I guess where I'm coming from with that was I had a moment of time where I thought I was going to switch over from my niche. And I think this topic goes along with the whole niche idea, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if if you feel like you're forced to be put into a box – as a photographer, you're going to burn out. So you got to think about what you want, not what people want to see. Because if you're doing what everybody else <clears throat> is doing or what you think you should be doing, you're going to burn out and you're going to be absolutely miserable. Yeah. That's my thoughts on it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like going into a career that you absolutely hate. Like you want to be a photographer, yes. great, but figure out what you want to shoot. Yeah. Because- you don't like doing family photos? Don't do family photos. No. I mean, don't don't be like me. I did or a lot you, of things I didn't want to do when I started. So, or if you do it because you need the money, do not yeah. post it. Right. There's yeah. so and much do, work I don't gonna, post. Right. It's like a snowball effect, right? Like you start getting all the those clients like. 
for me, like when I, I remember when I started, like I didn't necessarily want to be shooting families or weddings, but that was like the kind of people I was getting because everyone just assumed like, oh, she's a family and wedding photographer. Okay. Right. I said, because I'm a photographer. I didn't know how right. to articulate what kind of niche I was in because I wasn't so sure myself. So it was yeah, like hard for me I've to be there. clear about it. So it's just like, and then you start getting all these random things. Like I got events, I got you know, like one-year-olds, two-year-olds, I'd get family, <laughs> they'd get weddings, they'd get uh, headshots, yeah. they'd get, I'd be all over this, the place. We were confusing them on what we were selling, right? Because right. they, right. they're like, I see everything, you do it all, right? So yeah, your uh-huh. birthday smash cake. Yeah, yeah. And then you take it because you want the money and then you post it. Like, at least yeah. just don't post it. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree on that because yeah. it is a snowball effect. But there is a point in time like where you do like you need to learn from all of that. Right. And if you really don't know what you want to be shooting, uh, then you do need to be shooting all those things to figure out um, what you really like to do and then go from there. Because there there is an element of experimenting and, you know, trying to get that experience and get a feel for what kind of clients you like to work with. Like. What yeah. is your lifestyle like? You know, that's a huge element. That's of a it huge too. other like, topic. Are you going to work right? on weekends? Right. Are you going to work every weekend for yeah. weddings? Like, I mean, sometimes people, right. you don't want to give up your weekends. Don't shoot weddings, you know? Right. Um. So, yeah, I think that's a huge one that I see a lot of photographers fall into. And I, for the first half of my career, I yeah. was there. So it's very, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very uh, I, I relate 1000%. And I have girlfriends that are like, I really want to get into weddings more. And they're posting just like all the family shoots that they've been doing, which are absolutely mm-hmm. beautiful, but they keep getting more family shoots that are also beautiful, <laughs> but they want to do more weddings. I'm like, you want to do more weddings. You need to put more weddings in your, in your work. Right. And if people don't have the niche that they want to do, we recommend, Vanya and I always recommend doing um, workshops and yeah. just like setting up your own shoots. That way you can be posting stuff like that all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. You guys, I cannot stress that enough. Like it makes a huge difference to be posting what you want to be shooting. Also, like thinking about your ideal client and you know, considering what like if you want to shoot weddings, like you better shoot like you better think about what kind of weddings you you want to be shooting. Like do you want to be shooting elopements? Do you want to be shooting really uh huge weddings, like very luxury weddings? Like, do you want to be shooting more intimate, like more alternative? Like what do you like what kind of client fits into your niche? That's a good point. Thing? Like for me, yeah. I'm I'm doing weddings, right? But I want to get a certain type of weddings. And it's really yeah. hard for me because if I keep posting like big bridal parties, right? right. They're beautiful, but I'm just gonna keep getting big giant weddings. So if I want to niche into elopements, how am I gonna do that if people are seeing that I'm doing like very traditional weddings? So it's like right. it's really tough. It's a tough dance. I get every photographer on how it's tough because when you don't have the work coming in, it's like really hard to not post it because you wanna post something, especially if you're proud right. of it. But Right. Well, I guess like, I don't know, I guess my thoughts on that, Josie, is like, why couldn't you take like, so say you did a really big traditional wedding, like, couldn't you take elements from that and That's break what I was gonna it say. down and make it more look intimate and post only the intimate photos? Yep. And that that's what sense? I I meant to add that part too. Um, mm-hmm. When I'm when I was talking about adding the bridal party to my, for instance, Instagram feed, because I get most of my business there. Instead, I'm posting pictures of just the couple walking away without their floral bouquet because I maybe I don't yeah. like the floral bouquet. So yeah. that's kind of how I work around that. That's how I dance around yeah. that and try to make it look like I do more elopements so I can get more elopements. That's so, so there's a way to go around it. That's so you just got to be strategic. <laughs> yeah. Strategy is huge. Or even just yeah. styling like your own shoots that with the kind of people that you want to be shooting. Like if you want to be shooting, you know, like fam, like a certain kind of family or a certain kind of portrait subject or a certain kind of business or brand, like then go out and style your own shoots or join a workshop that, are, that already like styles it for you. That's based off of what you want to be shooting or the kind of style that yeah. you like or the kind of style that you can incorporate into your work. Like that's, it really comes down to like basically styling and making your portfolio really curated. Like that yes. is like, the number one thing um, I can say is curate your portfolio. Because <laughs> then Absolutely. you think of it the shoots that you don't want. <laughs> yeah, think of it like a, an art museum where they curate mm-hmm. the paintings to look a certain way. It's the same idea. You're curating your art, yeah. your artistic 
little space of the internet and you want it to look good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Any other thoughts on um on that subject? I don't think so. I think think we went really good into that. Okay. I feel like we could jump into the next one. Okay. So the next one is copying other photographers instead of using their work as inspiration. Oof. Yeah, that's a tough one because I feel like I still struggle with that sometimes and I even mm. get like depressed even now where I'm at in my business and I'm still booking a lot. Like yeah. I'll see like other photographers and their work is so good and I'm like, why can't I make my work look that – like, you know, like that's just not – don't do that. Don't try to like replicate that either. Yeah. Try to be inspired only. Vani, what is your take on this? Um, <laughs> So, Vanya, what is your take on that, copying other photographers instead Ugh. of using their work as inspiration? Okay, so there's a very fine line between copying and using others as inspiration. And Josie, what you just said is, I don't believe that's copying just because you feel inspired or by another photographer. I actually feel like that's more on like the comparing line. Like you're just comparing your work to other people's work. Okay. That's not so much yeah. copying. So that's that's natural. That's inherent with like I feel like just yeah. artists in general. Unless you live under a rock and you're not looking at any kind of thing at all and not feeling inspiration from anything other than yourself, like uh, then that's yeah, great, but <laughs> that's that's, <laughs> that's not normal. <laughs> that's, not, that's not really what we do typically. I don't think as artists we tend to, come, and especially with social media, like it's just it's going to happen. It's going to happen that you're going to be comparing yourself. So just yeah. being aware, I think, and noticing if you're comparing yourself to other photographers or other artists or whatever kind of creative field you are in, or if you're a professional, it doesn't matter where you are. Like just notice when you're comparing yourself and just stop and recognize it. And I think that in itself is really good for just, you know, stopping that negative self-talk or, you know, just coming down and like the comparing comparison thing and just noticing that you are amazing. You're very talented and just know that other people are looking at your stuff or whatever you're doing and they're probably feeling the same way. <laughs> so yeah, seriously, it's very normal, but that goes with the whole imposter thing. Yeah, totally. And we could speak hours on that. Maybe we'll do a podcast on that as well. Yeah. But um, so back to the copying, I just think that so when you're starting out, we tend to like look at other photographers work and, you know, think that we want to shoot exactly how they shoot. Like maybe you take some pictures that you like of a photographer and you copy them verbatim. Like this used to happen all the time. I know Josie when the, in the fashion industry, when people are doing like editorials and stuff, like you'd get these briefs or you'd get, yeah. um, you know, the inspiration board and people would take them like verbatim, like, Oh, you want a picture like this, like taking a whole pin, like a Pinterest picture and making it exactly like identical. Like you, I mean, clearly like it's yeah. not the same subject, but using the same lighting, using the same props, using the same back background, like all those things like that. That's not okay. Like that is copying. Like, so my, yeah. my copying cure <laughs> for that is to really think about why you like a certain photographer's work or think about the elements that you can pull out and you can start yeah. mixing and matching those. Like take like a handful of pictures. You know, I usually say about 10, put them on a vision board, just randomly pick what you like and then just start pulling. Like, do I like the colors? Do I like the lighting? Do I like the subject? Do I like yep. the composition, the mood? Like, what do you like about that photograph? That's it right there. That's gonna, that's really going to you know, take your work to another level and you're not going to feel like you're copying. You're going to feel like, wow, I really like this element and I like this element and I like this element and I like this element. And you're going to piece those together to make your own. Yeah. So basically if you make it your own, you're not going to feel disappointed that you're not making a replication of what somebody else did. No. You're making it your perspective. So it's yeah. good to be inspired, but to copy, it's, it's just going to be bad for you mentally. Right. What we're trying to say. Yeah, I don't think anyone feels good when they copy. I just, I no. don't, I don't, I don't see it. But yeah, but like Vanya said, I like that point of like 
gathering all the images that you like into like a for instance a pin board and seeing what did it what is it that I like about it is it the lighting is it the posing is it the clothing like that's a really good yeah. point yeah and then that way when you have a pin board of stuff you're obviously not going to be copying one thing you're going to have like a mood yeah of absolutely. what you want to create absolutely and that could really like that could even be like your whole photography style really like you could yeah do a whole board just how you want your portfolio to look like I do that every year. I'm like, oh, oh, I really like, I really like how this, these, these elements are popping out of here, but I use, you know, like I'll use art or paintings and pictures and music or philosophy. Yeah. Like I'll use a whole bunch of inspiration be like, this is how I want them to feel. Like this is what this, you know, like the going thread is in all of them. Like, no, no, it's just, there's so many elements you can pull for inspiration and That's not so smart copy verbatim because yeah. and, and really like looking outside of the photography world is going to be huge for not copying other photographers because I feel like when we yeah. look at a lot of other photographers work we're, we're inherently going to probably copy some of what they do because we're so inspired right maybe even subconsciously maybe we're not even aware that we're like copying somebody's work but uh, maybe just looking out for like other inspirations like nature or architecture or poetry, books, music. I mean, this or is shadow, all how shadows and light hit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's yeah. so much. Um, so that's how we feel about copying. Is there any other things that you want to say about that? No, that's a really good one, though. It's definitely. It's just not just about the copying part. Like, it's just about like you want to be healthy. And in order to be a healthy artist, or, you know, if you call yourself that as a photographer, mm -hmm. um, it's better just to mentally to not copy. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> just give me an idea and I'll talk about it to you afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> um, have to write that one down. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about our next point or next big mistake is not seeing yourself as the CEO of your business or your company. Um, do you want to kind of elaborate on that, Josie? Well, basically what we're trying to say about that is to take your position really seriously and you need to like consider how you're acting um, how you're dressing when you're shooting weddings. I see a lot of photographers wearing ripped up jeans. I don't think that's professional. Like to see yourself as a CEO, like you are the boss, like you mm -hmm. are representing yourself and your actions, your words, what you're posting. It's all super important. And Vanya, I'll let you put your, your take on that. Yeah. So I think a lot of, um, creatives, like well, I'm, I guess I'm speaking to the right brain people, <laughs> like yeah. you and I will see, but I mean, maybe not, not so many, like maybe your business major and you just happen, so happen to dabble in photography and you turn it into a business and uh, maybe not so much for those people, but I'm just thinking about like, when you're a creative and you're really right brained, like you tend to just see yourself as a creative artist. And when you are like, oh, I'm going to um, start making a business out of my passion and, uh, I don't know. Like, I feel like we tend to like not take ourselves as seriously. Like, te like that's why the, the term starving yeah. artist like came along because you just, ha you just have this tendency to not think business minded. Right. Yeah. And you kind of have to switch that around. It's, it's like neuroplasticity. Like you have to rewire your brain to think a certain way. Um, I, I had to work very hard on this. I still have to work hard on this. Like, and I have to be more business mind oriented. And this only happened in the last like three years because I had to practice to be business minded because I wasn't, I will like, you know, it's like, it's just when you don't show up and you just think that, oh, like I'll just be here and be here and be here and be here. Like it just, it doesn't work like that if you want to run a successful business and you actually want to make an income and you want to make a living off of it. Like, yeah. See yourself as a CEO, like be like you are important, like you're an important aspect. Like it's not nobody's going to care about your business as much as you care about your own business. And that's just a fact. Like you can hire all the people that you want, but in all honesty, like it's not theirs, like unless you make them, you know, part of the, your business, which is a really smart idea. But 
I'll go into that another time, but it's just, nobody's yeah. going to care about it as much as you do. Nobody's going to sell your work the like as much as you can or market your work as much as you can. So that's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah. Any other thoughts? I don't think so. Um, it's, it's pretty broad. Yeah. Okay. So, so kind of the next into, one, yeah. You want to jump into topic. the next one? Yeah. So that brings us into the next topic. We were just kind of talking about like not seeing yourself as a CEO and the next important part is not having your workflows in place. Um, and that kind of comes along with maybe being that more right brained person, that more creative person that's not so business oriented, but yeah, you might not think of workflows. Like they're super, super important. And I don't care who you say, who you are as a creative, like you oh need gosh. workflows, you need structure in order to feel free. Like I can't like so don't boring. think it's gonna put you in a box. Don't think it's gonna constrain you because it's not. It's gonna actually give you yeah. more freedom. Yeah. More time. More time. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that goes with everything the editing yeah. part the organizing your money part and your taxes and uh, mm -hmm. just like it's so deep <clears throat> yeah there's a lot of different <laughs> workflows that you need to have in place but well let's start with so one helpful. yeah let's, go ahead when did you talk about your some of your workflows the most important workflows that I have are having a good system where you can place all of your stuff at um, we're not in a place now where we have to have all these papers and notes and all these things everywhere just to have like a good digital system that you can rely on. For instance, like Dubzato, we use Dubzato for our business and it's super great because you can put your taxes in there and you can even categorize your taxes too. So at the end of the year, when you go to send it over to your accountant, you already have the categories and you don't have to spend like a whole week, which I've done that twice. Yeah. Spend a whole week trying to categorize and organize every single thing that went in or out. So I think that having Dubs Auto is great for um, that, organizing your expenses, organizing your calendar, just like everything's there. It's really, really great. And then I'll let you go into maybe some other different kinds of like workflow systems that are great. Well, you know how you know how I feel about Trello. Trello's been huge for us. Oh, yes, <laughs> Trello. Uh, Trello's amazing. Like just being able to categorize like certain boards for certain thing. Like you can have an editorial calendar, you can have a project management management system. Yeah. How many boards have, do we have? We yeah. Have so you can many. have workflows for your, you could actually even make a workflow in Trello for your photography shoots from like planning to shooting, to editing, to post-production. And you could share it too. And really you like, yeah, yeah. Sometimes like you don't need to pay it. Trello is free too. So yeah. Not, heads up. Like, it's free. Yeah, it is <laughs> for now. <laughs> better jump in there until it's not. Um, Right. So, yeah, it's a big one. I love Trello. I love that you can make little boards and you can collaborate with people. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's a huge one. I mean, any you could put any kind of workflow in there and it would just work fantastically. The other thing I was going to say about Dubsado is really great is you can have the, um, the intake forms to kind of get all the information from your clients. Like, yeah. so you get it right off of your site. It puts it right into Dubsado for you. So yeah. you already have those clients. Like you're not, you're not hand putting in clients into like a spreadsheet. Like it just yeah. automatically goes into the system, which is really great because you have all your clients information, you have notes, whatever, you know, whatever intake form that you have on your website you put it on, you put it in, it goes right into Dubs Auto and it has all the information. So yeah, it's all super organized. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, some other good workflow is uh, how you uh, upload your photos, download your photos, whatever. Um, the way you like the system that you have to keep everything organized and safe. I think that's really super important. What, and I um, think everybody does it differently. What do you use for that, and Josie? What'd you say? What system do you use for that? I don't think I've ever asked you for upload. I know. I use my own system. Is there a system for that? No. Well, I mean, yeah. well, I guess I thought you were talking about like maybe your client galleries, like your, or oh, Lightroom okay. or what are you, yeah. which one are you talking about? Oh, uh, so I, so I use Lightroom, obviously I use Photoshop for, mm -hmm. um, if I'm doing boudoir and I have to do touch ups or if I have to do something to someone that. Lightroom can't do. I use Photoshop for that. And then um, what else do I use? I use PicTime. 
for my galleries. And I think you do too, right? Yeah, same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, 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 pick time is great. <laughs> and I love pick time because you can actually upload the photos from your phone to post it on social media. I like that so much. And I yeah. didn't find that like other systems did that. Why do you like pick time? Oh my gosh. I Okay. So the thing I love about pick time is that, so what I do is I, when I edit in Lightroom, I can take all my edits. So maybe I do like a first pass and I do like a very like basic edit. I can put those into a client gallery. Like it's a, it's a, what is it? A plugin in Lightroom. I can take those photos, put it into the plugin in Lightroom oh. and then it transfers right from Lightroom. So the pictures are in Lightroom, but they're also in pick time. So okay. any picture. So like maybe my client makes a selection and they, maybe they have some more like uh, retouching that they'd like to do. And so what happens is that they pick those in pick time. I see them and then I edit them right in that gallery in Lightroom and it changes them once That's I so cool. publish and it changes them right to their gallery. So when I'm done uh, retouching fully for them, I just go go back to your gallery, download the ones that you like. Yeah. It's, I didn't even know. I mean, I think I've seen that you've done that, but I just didn't like dabble into it just because I, I think yeah. I'm kind of scared about the quality. Like it transferring over. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Cause I know that I've had it to where I transferred from Lightroom immediately over to Photoshop where I exported mm-hmm. it to Photoshop. And I remember it did something weird to the colors. And like, ever since that happened, I always just did it so old school. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I honestly, I haven't had a problem. I've been using it forever just cause it's such a that's time awesome. saver to like go back and like, but I get, I do a lot more like retouching probably than you do in the yeah, sense of like, definitely. you know, giving clients back photos. Like, so I think yeah. it just makes more sense for me to be able to, you know, touch things up like on the go. It's just faster that way. Yeah. So, so then instead of exporting from Lightroom to the folder, you export from Lightroom into PickTime. Like there's a button for that too. Yeah. So it's a button, it's a gallery. Like you'll have like a little, um, you have a little like extension plugin on the bottom of your Lightroom, like, uh, and it'll say like pick time, you plug it into pick time. Okay. I could be wrong. I'm not so technical on this. So forgive me <laughs> if I'm not wording this right. I don't know if it's a plugin. I'm just going to be completely honest. It, yeah. <laughs> you'll see it. And it's just you, you transfer your gallery from Lightroom that you've been editing, put it into the pick time gallery in Lightroom. It'll show up down here and then you hit publish and then it shows up on your pick time. So you're not exporting okay. your photos and then uploading them to pick time. It just, it saves that extra step of, I mean, I still export my photos, obviously, because yeah. I need to back them up. I need to save them. But So you uh, suggest doing both still? Yeah, oh, Definitely. yeah. I mean, I mean like, how are you going to have the photos otherwise? Right. But it's not like I'm, I'm having that extra step in between working on my client's photos. Like I back everything up a second time when I'm okay. done working. Um, when I'm done editing, when I'm doing their final edit. So yeah. I'll back it up, you know, again. So I back it up the first time right when I shoot. And then I back it up the second time when all the finals are done. And those are already given to the client because it just saves that extra step of exporting and then uploading to pick time and then changing the photos in Lightroom and then uh, going back to pick time and having to re-upload them, right? Yeah. Like you don't have to go back and forth. It just is one system. Yeah. So it's really, really, it's a really nice time saver, actually. Yeah. I highly recommend it. That's awesome. Yeah. So now that we went into workflows, <laughs> any yeah. other workflows you can think of? I, I know there's like a billion workflows, but those are like yeah. the main ones. I think your whole career is like a workflow, all of it, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, Yeah, that is true. Um, I feel like every photographer that I, I've seen, like educators talking or whatever over all the years or even like in like Facebook, Facebook groups and stuff like that do it differently as far as like how they load their SD cards and where, where they stick it from their SD cards. Like do mm-hmm. they put it on two hard drives or do they put it into Backblaze or do they leave it onto their computer or do they do all five? Like, yeah, you know, there's there's that too, which is so yeah. important as well. Yeah, I'm st- I'm still always looking for like the quickest like and most efficient workflow possible. I know, right? I'm always open <laughs> I'm always, to new ideas. Yeah. So I'm I'll say how I do it as a wedding photographer cuz it's scary as a wedding photographer cuz you don't yeah. want to lose images. So That's so much responsibility. Yeah, it's a huge responsibility. So when I'm shooting weddings, I always double check that nothing bumped. Um before I start a wedding, I always double check and make sure that it's on dual 
What does um, bump mean? Sorry. Like, I'm not that's good. okay. So sometimes I, I bump buttons because I have two cameras oh, okay. on each side of me. So I always make sure it's on raw. I mm. make sure because it's been bumped over to JPEG. I don't know mm. how it does it on the outside, but oh there's God. like, there's shortcuts on the outside of cameras. And I feel like that's sometimes a bad thing for wedding photographers where their cameras are bumping around. So I always know to double check is, is uh, autofocus on, like, I literally have had all these things bumped when I start a wedding, like oh it's happened God. one time or another. So now I know. Like I have a system, a work. I have a workflow, you yeah. know, where I Learn look at my camera. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, Learn from our mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always check my camera to make sure it's on all the things I want it to be on, and make sure it's absolutely perfect before I even get to the venue. Like I do all this stuff. Like this is another part of my workflow. Like the day before or mm-hmm. hours and hours before I start the wedding, I have my timeline ready. I have my watch ready. I have all those things ready. And then I make sure my camera is absolutely perfect. I make sure it's on dual card reader, make sure it's on raw. Um, and then when I get home, I upload, I make sure that both the cards read the same. Cause like sometimes one card will be like, I don't know if it's because I delete in camera, which is a big, no, no, don't do that. That's bad. Right. But I just naturally, I'm like, that was really bad. Right. You know, so I don't know if that's why sometimes one card has more than the other, but I always make sure because you never know, like it's their wedding day. So I always make sure that they're both perfect. And then I upload from that one card and then I save. I have, um, I have this like little system where I stick my cards in a medicine box and I label, I label the card with, I love that you you just pull that out. (laughs) <laughs> you're like, and this. <laughs> yes, girl. She didn't even plan stuff. this. She did not plan this. Look at all my, look at all my, um, so my clients' weddings from like all the way back to like 2015. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's another workflow because I want to make sure like I, you know, it says on my contract that I'm not responsible after a year for their wedding photos, yeah, but I'm right. kind of making a fib because I have them. Yeah, like, I don't ever want anybody to be without their wedding photos. Like if something yeah. was to happen, if they had a fire, God forbid something happened. Oh. I have, I have chills right now thinking about that. Cause it's oh. just, you have such a responsibility of people's wedding day. You really need to yeah. take it like 1000% seriously. If that's what you're shooting, obviously. I don't even know how you handle it. So I, it's, I that's too much. I've been doing it for I, my blood. <laughs> I know. I think it's cause I've been doing it for so long though. Cause like yeah. you start off and you're doing like one every three months, right? Right. 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 Or you're, you're only fine. just second shooting and it's like, it's mm. an ease. It's like, and then once you're doing it for like me, I'm, I like, I have seven in October and seven in November weddings. Weddings are elopements. All right. So I'll see, you in, uh, I'll see you in December. <laughs> I'll see you in uh, next year. <laughs> yeah. We'll be batching out some podcasts. That's for sure. Oh my God. Um, in August. <laughs> oh my gosh, girl. <sighs> September Crazy. and August. I'm pretty slow, but I'm sure those will fill up with people that are visiting Florida. So yeah, that's what you it's should have in last minute. That's good. Not but a bad yeah, problem to have. Those are my good workflows. Um, I can't think of anything else. Um, just having really good bags too to carry your stuff, and one that has like a good water pocket mm-hmm. um, where you can put a water, a bottle of water in there. I think that's so important. Like I, I never thought about that until like like recently. How important it is to have a place to put like your water because you need water. Yeah, for sure. So I've been using. I think it's called Brevite or Brevit. How do you say that? Brevetti. Oh. Yeah, I always see advertisements. For, is that for the bag? So, okay, the yeah. Part? So I just got it because it's like really? I don't like I don't like being trendy. I'm like weird. I like to be like the opposite. I'm like everybody's doing that, so I'm gonna do that. But yeah. it's actually thirty dollars off all the time. It's always advertised as thirty dollars off. It's white uh-huh. and it like matches even my bedroom. It's like it's like a white gray color. It's really pretty. Is it good, like, is it a good like organizer? Because I kept I keep looking yes. at it and I'm like I should get one of those, but I, I just keep not doing it. <laughs> yes, and you can put your laptop in there. So when you're traveling, I obviously factored the fact in that I'm going to be traveling for weddings, so I can put my laptop in there, so I can do part mm-hmm. of my workflow and back up my yeah. photos before I fly. And yeah. I'll have um, one SD card um, in one place, one SD card in the other place. Like for instance, one could be in one of my luggages, one will be in my like personal bag. So I mm-hmm. split the cards in two different places. Cause I shot on two cards. Right. So I have yeah. one in my backpack. I have one in my suitcase and then I have one on my computer cause I don't want to lose anything. So. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. And my computer also immediately uploads to Backblaze as well. So it's also, if let's say God forbid something happened to the plane, <laughs> yeah, it's in Backblaze. So, um, so definitely people thinking about watching that are Josie's clients. You are saved. <laughs> You are saved. You have a oh god. god. <laughs> you have an angel. Work, work <laughs> are so important. 
do yeah. not express that enough. Yeah. Do you it's, have any more that you can think of that I would like to learn about? You know, I have a lot for like planning, like just going through my planning for my photo shoots. You know, it's just like I do like pretty much like the same process every single time. I have kind of like a system that I have in my head that I go through on the day of the shoot. Right. Yeah. And then I obviously have an, an after like words or post-production workflow that I don't know. I've just been doing, of course, I've been doing it for so long. I just, it's in my head now, but I, yeah. I do plan on writing it out and, you know, making a course of some sort out of it because I think it is super important to be able to have yeah. that direction because if you don't have that direction, it's like, you know, you just feel like you're all over the place and you, you just feel really confused and not confident and it's just not a good place to be in. And I remember being in that place and I don't like to feel like scatterbrained and this just saved so much time and so much, you know, hassle of just not feeling nervous. You know, it's like that. I'm sure you remember like feeling nervous, like when you get to a shoot or feeling nervous after the shoot, like, did I mess up? Did I miss anything? Yeah. You don't really get those feelings that much anymore. No, because of being prepared. Like you're saying. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Um, But yeah, I don't think, I mean, we can go into workflows a different time too. So yeah, we could definitely elaborate in that more. I feel like even having a take from both of us, like two separate courses, just because like I do weddings, you do portraits and they're so different. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that would be super helpful. So that way people can just like be like, okay, I'm doing weddings. So I could, I could, you know, learn more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I'm sure it's so different. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I think the last thing that we kind of wanted to touch on is like not feeling like you can have a community of other photographers. Yeah. Um, I think that when I know you and I both started, like we basically kind of always had each other, but we didn't yeah. know about like photography groups. They weren't aware of like workshops. That wasn't really a thing when we started. It was no. more just kind of like do it on your own, have fun, like because everyone was so yeah. cutthroat and so competitive. And I feel like nowadays it's it's just shifting. It's shifted so much. And I appreciate I love that it. so much. It's just it's community over competition. And I can't stress really that enough is. because it's gonna come back to you tenfold. Like it will. Yeah. Because when you start making that group of other friends to like kind of bounce off of that are other creatives, other photographers that are industry, like maybe you don't have a family or friends around you that understand what you're doing and they, maybe they don't have the best advice and maybe, you know, like it's, it's really hard to do something and make it somewhere, you know, in a creative industry when you don't have the people around you to support you. Like I just don't stress that enough. So just if you want to speak a little bit on, Absolutely. How do you feel about that? So Vanya and I started photography like back before social media was even a thing. Like there was Facebook Mm. though. So, um, well, we started when there was MySpace, but then Facebook came out shortly after and I learned a lot from Facebook groups, but they weren't like that community feeling because they knew it's basically like your neighbors, right? You treat your neighbors good. Well, most people do because you know, you have to be around them all the time. It's the same thing with the community of photographers. We, we all are making a name for ourselves, and we don't want to be an asshole because mm-hmm. we want people to like us and we want people to recommend us. We want to make a good name for ourselves, And I think that's where it's coming from. I think that's why people are being so kind also because they know they, yeah. they get back from what they put into it. Mm-hmm. They get back, back out of it from what they put into it. So yeah. I feel like it's super important to build relationships and um, – like for people wanting to get into like weddings, for instance, um, definitely making friends with wedding photographers. Like I yeah. definitely have my select few people that I have assist for me or my select few people I have second shoot for me just because they know how I work and I know how they work and we felt a relationship. We built the relationship first though. Yeah, so absolutely. that's why we both recommend to make friends, even if you're doing just portraits too, right, mm-hmm. Vanya? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you never know like who you're going to meet. Like I... I mean, I have so many, like, just, I mean, just people in different creative fields that I use, like, on a consistent basis, you know, from hair, yeah. makeup, styling to... Okay, um, so, so outside of photography. Yeah, even French outside of photography. Like, I think that it's, you know, it's just any any creatives that you can come together that you just yeah. kind of vibe with. Like, I think that that's super important. Like, not just photographers. I mean, of course, that's right. nice. But that makes so much sense. Yeah, but just having like a community of just creatives, like anybody, like in the like in the web or graphic design, yeah. like I think that's Absolutely. super important. I think 
you know, I've just, I've had so many like clients in different genres of things. It's just nice to be able to kind of implement them in like my system or works or offerings or services or work with a team of people versus hi, it's just me. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Also like, again, going back to like the, you know, photography, having photographer friends is super important too. And like building that community. And I'm just going to put this out there. Like you do need to be more community oriented instead of just being competitive. Like don't go to a workshop, don't go to a portfolio building. If you're going to overstep and you're going to think that you can just run the show and that you're going to like, just yeah, that's not, not cool. being just being a kind human. Like it's not hard. <laughs> yeah. And I just feel like photographers sometimes get this like uh weird ego thing going on where they just right. they kind of just want to like, you know, push everyone over, like get out of my yeah. way. And then, and then you get the opposite end of the spectrum where it's like, oh, I don't want to like I don't want to see anything. I don't want to like overstep yeah. my boundaries. I don't want to like you know, you just let people kind of walk all over you. It's not good to be either ends of the spectrum, you know, it's just yeah. Just focus on serving and being kind to people. And when you go out and build your community um, or join ours. <laughs> yes, we <laughs> you should know, make just, forever friends. Yeah. Just you know, go read our review. Nice. <laughs> yeah, because like the people that were kind to each other at our workshops, they are to this day friends and they've collaborated, created different types of shoots. And now they're even shooting weddings together. So yeah, uh, definitely creating an, a nice little circle of friends. And like you were saying, like, not just photographers, like I have a makeup artist friend that I'm super close with and we talk yeah, all the same. time and it's really nice to bounce ideas with another right side, right side brain mm-hmm. individual besides photographers, just because yeah. you'll get like a different take. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely nice to have a good close knit of people that you can rely on um, for different shoots. Like Fania does, like Fania has her um, fashion shoots. And so she has her go-to makeup artists and go-to different types yeah. of people and it and it goes the same way for me too because I have my go-to second shooters and I have my go-to makeup artists as well because I also you know we we put together stuff yeah so. absolutely it's so important anything you want to add to those mistakes Josie uh I don't think so mm-hmm. um I'm sure one, there's like a billion more <laughs> one last thing I guess we can go over uh since we're talking about mistakes that new photographers are making when they're starting their business is as far as their gear goes. I think that Mm. um, just being careful with what kind of gear you're spending your money on. Don't think that, don't think that you have to buy brand new Mm because I never bought brand new. No, no. When I started, Mm -hmm. I didn't buy brand new. I actually, I don't want to recommend this because I don't, I, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. You got to do all the homework, but I, I do recommend it for myself, but I'm not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I got my first uh, good DSLR from eBay. And I remember it being like 700 to to $1,000 or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it was a good, reliable dual shooter, uh, dual SD card camera Yeah. that I feel like wedding photographers need to have. And it was used and that's okay. So what I did was as I got jobs – all that money, I didn't make any income for like the first couple of years. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. So everything went to gear. So I just was being smart about it. I knew I needed to have the good gear, but I knew I also didn't have to buy brand new. So, Well, also like, you know, just know, knowing what to spend your money on, like you said, like, I don't think yep. like I started out with a, a Canon. No, actually, I started out on a film camera, to be honest. That, oh, that is so another, cool. Another what story, kind of film camera? It was just a hand-me-down film camera. and you know, that's, that's what so I started cool. on. I didn't have no clue about lighting, had no clue about settings. I just yeah. did what I did. And then when I went to digital, I got like the cheapest like Canon EOS like <laughs> camera that you could switch lenses. That was like very important, right? Because your glass is like, if you're going to spend money on something, spend money on your glass. Like, yeah, I agree with you. One thing, <laughs> one thing I would say, everything would else. Don't just, have a crop sensor though. Don't go to what? Oh, crop sensor? Don't have a crop sensor camera. Oh, that's what I, well, I started on a crop sensor. I, I don't started on a crop sensor, but like, it just sucks because like, if you're shooting weddings, it's just like, oh, uh, well, which is okay. 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 But it's different. I mean, you can, it's doable. It's doable because it is doable. I, I did it. <laughs> I shot plenty of weddings on crop sensor. It's just, you I have know. to back up more than you want to. Yeah. Right? Basically, shot, you're just moving around a lot more, right? Yeah. I shot on a 50 millimeter 1.8. 
<laughs> Same. Yep. I'd be like, I can't back up enough yep. like inside the reception. And I didn't know why. Like it just it took a while for yep. me to figure everything out because I didn't have things oh, like gosh. what we're doing. Yeah, like I just don't have resources. Whole, like you shot a whole wedding on a 50 millimeter. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I did the same Top thing. Sensor. And I didn't know, I didn't know anything else. I was like, these photos are gonna look amazing because I can do I can do a low aperture. Yeah, right. Yeah, just that low aperture. <laughs> that low aperture on and everything's gonna turn out great. Beautiful. <laughs> I learned really quickly. Oh yeah. Definitely for sure. No, that's All it's always good starting out though, because it does give you the confidence, right? It's just like it, yeah. it's like so good. On a fifty on a fifty millimeter, I'd say that would be a number one starting lens. Fifty millimeter. Fifty millimeter, I always say that, or thirty five. Um, Mm-hmm. 35 I think 35 to be just for me just for like if you're going to be doing events I feel like a 35 is better just because you can back up more well especially with a if you're doing if you do have a crop sensor or you go the crop sensor route do a 35 yeah. millimeter versus a 50 millimeter because you're going to get or even 24 but I can yeah. get distorted so it's just 24 you're can? Do a prime yeah if you really? go all the way to 24 well if it's zoom I mean you're able to oh, zoom, okay it's 24 to 70 yeah but if you go to a 24, then it's it's very, very wide. So you don't have that option to like. Yeah. Ha- have you ever shot on a 24 millimeter prime before? No. Is I that even one. a thing? Yeah. Is that a thing? It is? Yeah, I absolutely want one just because I love that focal point so much on my 24 to 70. Yeah. And I got my 35 millimeter out recently and did a few sessions on it. And I was like, holy sharp. Like, holy crap really? sharpness. I forgot Ooh. how sharp my 35 millimeter 1.4 Sigma lens is. Because I got to calibrate it too a lot. Yeah. Well, on my film camera, I have a, a 28 millimeter. And that's pretty nice. I like that. Yeah. I like I like the smaller focal points because you just have so much room to back up. And so yeah. I'm really highly considering getting one. I'm thinking about getting it for my Z series, mm. for my Nikon Z series. Yeah. They're not cheap though. They're like two grand. Yeah. But I really, really love the primes. I forgot how much – why I forgot why I was a prime snob until I got that that lens out. I know. I was so into primes, but now I I barely – I'll use my 85 millimeter. And then yeah. most of the time I have my 24 to 70 because I, I do a lot of outdoor like on the beach and I'm just like walking. It's just right. – I need it's to just be able easy. to zoom in, zoom yeah. out kind of thing. So, But I yeah. think because I have mirrorless Canon, the, R, the R6 now – I want yeah. to get the uh, 28 to 70 lens, and that'll oh. be my only lens. That's it. Why did the 28 <laughs> to 70 goes down, the series for the for the camera? Well, it goes down to 2.0 for an aperture, and that's like oh. unheard of for a zoom lens. It, it is. It, it's really crazy. So it's like oh, one wow. of the only zoom lenses that goes down that low. So I was like, if it can go down that low and it can zoom and it can be sharp, that will literally be my only How lens. How much is it? <laughs> oh, it's pushing three grand. Oh, gosh. So, I'm just sitting on it. I'm just kind of like, eh. plus it, like everything's on back order and you can't get like anything. So really, I haven't, I haven't looked in a while, it. but I just ordered uh, a flash and a, uh, a battery overnight because I waited till last minute. I have a very long wedding um, tomorrow. It's 10 hours. Mm-hmm. And with my mirrorless, I only had two good batteries. Right. And it was mm-hmm. fine with like eight hour weddings or six hour weddings. Cause like I would just sneak it into a, a socket somewhere and plug it in you know yeah. if I needed it. Yeah. it was usually fine my batteries actually last really long but I just would plug it in but this wedding I'm like 10 hours I'm not dealing with that so I had to overnight it and what then I needed a good flash you what'd you say what kind of flash do you use I I do Nikon's um I have the cheap ones now this is gonna be my fourth flash but um I just really like Nikon wow. like for some reason I don't know what it is but I got the Nikon mm. SB 700 So it's not like the top of the line brand new, what they're just coming out with. I'm not that girl where I have to have the top of the line, whatever, especially with a flash. I just need a good, reliable, it's refurbished from Adorama. So yeah. Adorama. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. I got rid of all my flashes and I got pro photo. Now I feel like we're just nerding out on gear. (laughs) Yeah, we are so nerding out. <laughs> we just but, started. Sorry, made like, totally, we love we're you. About, totally talking about like not getting the fanciest gear, and here we are nerding out on our gear. Um, I okay. know. <laughs> but, it up. We've been doing this a long time, and we've collected like over ten years of stuff. So when you're just starting out, don't feel like you need all these fancy things. It's just maybe just get a flash. They're such good cheap ones. Gosh, yeah, they're very. Good. I think my first ones they were like thirty bucks a piece, like yeah. nothing. Like, and they always worked great. So yeah, but 
camera body and good glass. I think that's it. That's all you need. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Or even if you have a phone, just use your phone. <laughs> yeah, put some, put some, uh, yeah. you can get lenses for your phone. I think those are awesome. Yeah, there's really good phones out there. That'd mm-hmm. be fun to do like a challenge with our phones. Like, yeah. do you really need a good camera? Let's use yeah. our cell phones. <laughs> yeah, let's do that. I think that'd be really cool. That'd let's do that on our next video. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, we can do a little photo shoot challenge. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. All right. All right, cool. So are we wrapping it up? Yeah, I think so. I think that's it. I think we set our piece. Let's uh let's finish it off with the fact that we have a workshop coming up on yeah. August twenty second. We know we talked about it on the last podcast, but we haven't really announced it on Instagram yet just because mm-hmm. we have announced it, but we haven't been like advertising it like crazy like we usually do. We just haven't yeah. jumped into it. So we wanted like our fall fo- our real followers to get like the insight first. Yeah, absolutely. And if you haven't already, like please sign up for our newsletter because we'll be giving uh, our info for that workshop first to the people on our newsletter. Yeah. So you'll have a chance to sign up first before even it gets announced on social Yeah, because there's a top off at 12 photographers because we want to keep it yeah. nice and intimate. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a awesome planner. She was on our last show, Patricia, that's going to be yeah. helping us. So that's going to be really great for Vanya and myself because we can really focus on our students and just like walk around and educate or photograph yeah. or just yeah. give us a lot of a lot more wiggle room. And it's going to be amazing styling. So it's going to yeah. be. Gonna the be vibe awesome. is elopement. And we're going to have two couples. And how many stations? Was it three or four? There might be three, well, four ish. Yeah, I don't know if we Like a table. I don't know if we and then like a lay flat. Details, yeah. yeah. So we'll get those details squared away and definitely get that over. So be sure to subscribe to our newsletter so you'll get the first. Yeah. Ends. All right. All right. Have a blessed day. Wrapping it up. All right. Peace (laughs) out. Bye. Bye.